the Divine Mother. The effort of the earlier chapters of this video book series, How I Came to Sri Aurobindo, has been to trace the development of yoga through the ages, to develop the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo and integral yoga, and to introduce the reader to the mother. In the last chapter, Shadalu Ranade discussed the way in which Brahman, God, Purusha, the soul, and Prakriti, nature, are forever linked together as one being in three different poises. And it is the interaction of the three poises that allows for the fulfillment of divine expression, fulfillment in soul growth, and fulfillment in the joy of the Lord being able to behold the creation. God needs nature and the individual soul for fulfillment. Nature needs God and the individual soul for fulfillment. The soul needs nature and God for fulfillment. These three are forever tied together in intimate necessity. Let us bring Shadalu Ranade's clear voice forward from his synthesis of yoga offering of February 22nd, 2019. The reading and commentary comes from chapter 17, The Soul and Its Liberation, in the Synthesis of Yoga. Shadalu says, Now so far we can play with this relationship. God is always behind all activities of nature. Every activity, movement or form of nature is as if concealing God which is behind or expressing God from behind but conceals at the same time as it expresses. So you look at a flower and you can say, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's so different from that flower which is also beautiful. Or you can say, ah, it is God smiling in this form in this way and God smiling in that form in that way. But the beauty of this formulation of reverse and obverse is that one cannot exist without the other. You see, if you take a sheet, there is a reverse side and there is an obverse side. But the implication is the sheet cannot exist unless it has two sides. Or one side cannot exist unless the other side is simultaneously as importantly present. You remove nature, there is no God that you can perceive. You remove God, there is no nature that can be expressed. It means nature does not have a separate existence of its own or God does not have a separate existence from nature. The moment there is a divine presence, nature must be there. That nature may be half asleep, it can become the emptiness of space. As if nature is lost in darkness, but she is still there. The nature of emptiness, we will say. But on the other side, when nature begins to become active, what she reveals is the Divine Presence which is hidden behind. And when nature awakens to herself and becomes fully freed from her own limitations and denseness and obscurity, she reveals the true nature which is Divine. And so implied in this articulation are so many profound insights. If you dwell upon this, meditate on it, you'll find many interesting things. So this is the first passage I want to read. Nature, the offers side of God, our conscious existence. To rise out of sevenfold ignorance into the integral knowledge is the progress of man's being. He starts with three categories, himself, that's man, nature or cosmos and God. And though he tries to deny any two of these in order to affirm the third only, he cannot really succeed for he is neither separate nor sufficient to himself. If you separate yourself you find something is missing and you have to eventually find your completeness in these two. Cosmos also is not sufficient to itself but points always to an infinite, one and absolute, behind it. So if you just had a universe, as we saw, the picture of the universe given by science is rather dull and pointless. 
if there was not in the whole universe a sense of purpose of rising towards some higher possibility, discovering a oneness to be expressed and a whole sense of direction and meaning in its unfolding, something is missing again. So that it, it always points to an infinite one and absolute behind it. And to affirm the absolute to the exclusion of these two others leaves man unsatisfied and cosmos unexplained. If you say there is only the absolute divine, something is missing and you can't explain why cosmos is like this. So in affirming himself, man has first to put himself in front and act and feel as if God and the world existed for him and were less important to him than himself. This is his egoistic phase necessary to disengage his individuality out of nature and as if against her and to bring it out into force and capacity. Now you see the importance of ego. The ego itself is the mechanism by which nature is forming individuality. In the quest of God he begins by seeing him through nature and himself crudely and obscurely at first, till he finds more luminously the one truth behind all religions. So looking through nature you discover, ah, there is the divinity in the beauty of nature, in the multiplicity of nature, and then in the different ideas of the different religions, because each represents an aspect of the divine. And finally, Sri Aurobindo writes, when he arrives at the unity of his knowledge of God, man and nature, he has the complete knowledge the sense and the goal of humanity's progress and labor and the sure foundation of all perfections and all harmonies. So this is the summary he gives of an entire chapter in the life divine. What do we mean by man? This is the last sentence of this section. An uncreated and indestructible soul that has housed itself in a mind and body made of its own elements. So we are the soul, uncreated and indestructible. In that sense, essentially a part of the divine that has housed itself in a mind and body made of what elements? Of its own elements, that is nature. Now, having gone through this passage, we review the point Sri Aurobindo makes by knowing the eternal unity of these three powers of the eternal manifestation, God, nature and the individual self, and their intimate necessity to each other, we come to understand existence itself. So what is their unity? The one divine and his power of consciousness and knowing himself in infinite possibilities and the power to deploy all that knowing into an experience of infinite and eternal manifestation, becoming many. That's man and nature, they are not separate. Into all this movement of pouring, he is always present and organizes centers of himself and that is the individual. They are never separate. They are never different. They are just one consciousness in three different poises. So God, nature and individual, their oneness. And now their intimate necessity to each other. Elsewhere in one of the articles, Sri Aurobindo writes, nature is the will of God. Without the will of God to manifest, the divine remains unfulfilled, unexpressed. So God needs nature. Nature needs God because that is the absolute which is her fulfillment. Otherwise nature finds she is incomplete and all that she aspires for, all the beauty and all the joy and all the love is there in that source which she has to now capture and find here. And the only way by which she can reach that is by focusing to concentrate to build an individual. 
and many individuals and each of those will capture an aspect of the divine. So nature needs the individual to recover her oneness with the divine. The individual needs nature in order to experience the divine and express the divine in life. And God needs the experience of the individual to be able to play out a multiplicity in the drama, in the play of delight. Each has an intimate necessity for each other. These three are as if the points of the triangle that make possible what is described as eternal manifestation. But we will take another passage where Sri Aurobindo has written in a little booklet called Thoughts and Glimpses and it's a part of a larger uh, discussion but a series of aphoristic statements in which he describes the relationship of God, man and nature. So I will read these. We won't elaborate too much, but only where some insights need to be highlighted. First is Aids. The title of this section is Man the Purusha. God cannot cease from leaning down towards nature, nor man from aspiring towards the Godhead. It is the eternal relation of the finite to the infinite. When they seem to turn from each other, it is to recoil for a more intimate meeting. So this is the first aphorism. Very interesting. The relationship between the finite and the infinite. What is it truly? The infinite always needs to lean towards the finite because that is how it can express itself. If something is one infinite without a finite appearance, you could not see it. We can see the flower because the whole infinity of the universe puts forward a finite front which we call flower. But if you really observed carefully, flower cannot exist without stem, stem cannot exist without plant, which cannot exist without mountain, which cannot exist without, without all the way to the universe. Right now the entire universe is leaning forward to nourish and support the existence of a single flower. The infinite has to lean towards the finite in order to be able to express itself. On the other hand, the finite also needs to lean towards the infinite. So what does the finite feel? I end here. But the moment I end here, there is something which continues. Otherwise, how do, I know, how do I know that I ended here? The moment I say my body stops here, there is something beyond which is not me, but which is continuing. And how far does it go? Put a limit. The moment you stop, there has to be something more. Otherwise, you couldn't stop. Now conceive of the universe. How big is the universe? Put a limit on it. Let's say the universe ends at this point. What's after? Something continues, which is after all universe. So the very nature of finiteness is that even as it exists because it is finite, it discovers it could not exist if there was not the infinite in which the finite exists. And so it discovers its ultimate reality is the infinite. Otherwise finiteness was not possible. I am the small piece because there is this infinite which supports the small piece. Sri Aurobindo on the Mother For Sri Aurobindo's Integral Yoga, the Divine Mother is said not only to be the womb of all terrestrial manifestation, but also the will and force of God. Consciousness manifests through the Mother of mind, life, and matter. In Integral Yoga, the way to open to the Divine Mother is by opening oneself up to the Mother, Mira, and to let her do the work through you. Sri Aurobindo says, There is one Divine Force which acts in the universe and in the individual and is beyond the individual and the universe. 
The mother stands for all these, but she is working here in the body to bring down something not yet expressed in this material world so as to transform life here. It is so that you should regard her as the divine Shakti working here for that purpose. She is that in the body, but in her whole consciousness. She is also identified with all the other aspects of the divine. To give comment to the present day situation, Mira, the mother, is every bit as present today as she was when she inhabited her earthly form and directed the Sri Aurobindo ashram. The mother and Sri Aurobindo came to bring in a new age of consciousness and awareness. They battled their way through adversity to bring the living light of truth down to earth. The two functioned as one. The mother ran the operation of the Sri Aurobindo ashram, was behind the publication of a huge number of books from Sri Aurobindo and Sadaks of the ashram, initiated the ashram school, initiated the higher education system of integral yoga, took charge of all business operations and finances of the ashram, took care of the daily needs of the inmates of the ashram, food, health, care, and all basic necessities, started the township of Oroville, and we have barely begun to scratch the surface of what the mother did. Having said all this, the power of the mother is even greater today than it was when she inhabited her earthly form. If we wish to align with Sri Aurobindo, then we must align with the mother, for the two are one. Sri Aurobindo says, You have only to aspire to keep yourself open to the mother, to reject all that is contrary to her will, and to let her work in you. Doing also all your work for her and in the faith that it is through her force that you can do it. If you remain open in this way, the knowledge and realization will come to you in due course. Sri Aurobindo and the mother were not impressed with the ascetic traditions of India, nor with most of the ascetics who wander around India. Sri Aurobindo has written extensively about the damage the ascetic tradition has done to India by taking untold numbers of the best minds of India out of the worldly existence, weakening India and allowing foreign invasions to occur, with the net result being that India has been brought down several notches from its world leadership position that it held from the time of the Mahabharata 8,000 plus years ago until 500 or so years ago. One of the main messages of Integral Yoga is we must work for the good of terrestrial life and not detach into some aloof state of being. Sri Aurobindo says, The mother does not think that it is good to give up all work and only read and meditate. Work is part of the yoga, and it gives the best opportunity for calling down the presence, the light, and the power into the vital and its activities. It increases also the field and opportunity of surrender. It is not enough to remember that the work is the mother's, and the results also. You must learn to feel the mother's forces behind you and to open to the inspiration and the guidance. Always to remember by an effort of the mind is too difficult, but if you get into the consciousness in which you feel always the mother's force in you or supporting you, that is the true thing. For sadaks of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, it is the force and the will of the mother through which the evolutionary forces work and she is the one to turn to. 
Sri Aurobindo says, The mother's force is not only above on the summit of the being, it is there with you and near you, ready to act whenever your nature will allow it. It is so with everybody here. The mother and Sri Aurobindo point us to the Divine Mother for future hope and for soul liberation. In Sri Aurobindo's epic poem, Savitri, a legend and a symbol, the main character, Savitri, is none other than the mother. Savitri lives on in the world today as a symbol of hope for humankind. Mira, the mother, received the transcendent Shakti, the cosmic Shakti, and the universal Shakti, so the world could be dug out of ignorance and she continues to receive the three levels of Shakti. The Mother and Sri Aurobindo have brought down the living light of truth, the supramental light, to the planet and continue to work on the supramental transformation upon the earth. Though facing huge opposition from the Asuric forces of darkness, this living light continues to grow and continues to expand within terrestrial life. The long-awaited avatars have already come and gone, but they are not gone, for Sri Aurobindo and the Mother live on in every finite action of the infinite and in every temporal act within eternity. Sri Aurobindo and the Mother point us to the Divine Mother. We should listen to what the avatars had to say about this. How might we begin to recognize who the Divine Mother is? For this we will go to Shatalu Ranade's presentation on Sri Aurobindo's book entitled The Mother. His words come from an integral yoga retreat given in the United States and this particular talk comes from July 1st, 2017 in Greenville, South Carolina. In the blue of the sky, 
in the green of the forest? Whose is the hand that has painted the glow? When the winds were asleep in the womb of the ether, who was it roused them and bade them to blow? He's lost in the heart, in the cavern of nature. He's found in the brain where he builds up the thought. In the pattern and bloom of the flowers he's woven. In the luminous net of the stars he's caught. In the strength of a man, in the beauty of woman. In the laugh of a boy, in the blush of a girl. The hand that sent Jupiter spinning through heaven spends all its cunning to fashion a girl. These are his works and his veils and his shadows. But where is he then? By what name is he known? Is he Brahma or Vishnu, a man or a woman, bodied or bodiless? Win or alone. We have love for a boy who is dark and resplendent. A woman is lord of us, naked and fierce. We have seen him amuse on the snow of the mountains. We have watched him at work in the heart of the spheres. We will tell the whole world of his ways and his cunning. He has rapture of torture and passion and pain. He delights in our sorrow and drives us to weeping, then lures with his joy and his beauty again. All music is only the sound of his laughter. All beauty the smile of his passionate bliss. Our lives are his heartbeats, our rapture the bridal of Radha and Krishna, our love is their kiss. His strength that is loud in the blare of the trumpets, and he rides in the car and he strikes in the spears, he slays without stint and is full of compassion. He wars for the world and its ultimate years. In the sweep of the worlds, in the surge of the ages, ineffable, mighty, majestic and pure, beyond the last pinnacle seized by the thinker, he is throned in his seat that forever endure. The master of man and his infinite lover, he is close to our hearts, had the vision to see. We are blind with our pride and the pomp of our passions. We are bound in our thoughts where we hold ourselves free. It is he in the sun who is ageless and deathless. And into the midnight his shadow is thrown. When darkness was blind and engulfed within darkness, he was seated within it.